In 2001, the pilots of an F-18 taking off from a US Navy aircraft carrier did something that very few people would see coming. Immediately after being catapulted during a dark night with low clouds, the pilot mysteriously pushed the nose of the aircraft down and descended into the ocean. And to figure out why, today we're going to talk about this. The Delft University of Technology's Simona Research Simulator. This entire machine has one purpose, and that is to trick your brain into feeling like it's flying a real aircraft. Located in the city of Delft in the Netherlands, the simulator uses three projectors to generate an image on this dome, showing the pilots a virtual view from the cockpit. The entire cabin is supported by six hydraulic actuators, which are used to move the simulator in all six dimensions. Three translations and three rotations. But how do the simulator's movements correspond to the actual movements of the aircraft? And more importantly, what kinds of sensations do people even feel when they're flying in a plane? Because as we're about to find out, the goal of the simulator is actually not to match the aircraft's movements per se. For example, it's entirely possible for the pilot to be flying straight and level, but looking at the simulator from the outside, you might see the platform pitching up or down, which is not what you'd initially expect. But before we get into these seeming paradoxes, it's worth talking about why researchers spend so much time and effort on these things in the first place. Since almost every day, Simona is being used by the Tudal Faculty of Aerospace Engineering to learn about how pilots control and interact with aircraft. One of the areas of our research focuses on motion cueing, which is about figuring out how to optimally fool the perceptions of pilots by manipulating their senses. For this, it's useful to think about humans having inputs and outputs. For example, during research, pilot behavior is often modeled with something called the black box method. This is where we imagine the human operator to be some unknown algorithm that takes a set of inputs from the environment. Things like instruments, the view of the runway, and even sounds, for example. If we imagine humans as an algorithm, then one of our most important inputs comes from our vestibular system or inner ear, which can sense things like angular acceleration. Our inner ear is not only known to play a significant role in our sense of balance, but can also drastically affect pilot's behavior and can even cause disorientation in certain situations. Another important input to our human algorithm is, weirdly enough, your seat, or more specifically, the forces between your body and the chair that's supporting you. Let's start with rotation in pitch, roll, and yaw. As a first try, let's just move the platform to match the orientation of the aircraft. So for example, if you're making a turn to the left, let's just try rotating the platform to match the roll angle of the plane. Although this seems logical, rather quickly you'd find that this method has some problems. If you've ever been in a normal turn in a real aircraft, you may have noticed that, paradoxically, it never really feels like you're being tilted at an angle, even if the aircraft is being rolled by as much as 30 degrees. This is similar to how you need to lean your bike towards the inside of the turn when you're cycling at a certain speed. The faster the bike travels, or the tighter the turn, the more roll you'll need to stay balanced, which is also the case in an aircraft. But if we look at our simulator, you'll notice that this doesn't apply, since the platform isn't actually traveling anywhere. As a result, if we move the simulator to match the roll angle of the plane, it would be like tilting a bike that's standing still. Due to gravity, the bike would of course fall over, and in our simulator, this means that people will feel an unrealistic side force as a consequence of the simulator's roll.
So now we've established that if we're in a coordinated turn with a constant roll angle, then the simulator must stay level, which is great. But what about when we enter and exit a turn? If the roll angle is changing over time, then the rate at which this angle changes is called the roll rate. This is important to know because your inner ear can sense when the roll rate itself changes. So, as it turns out, we do actually need the simulator to roll. But we can't do this too much or for too long because otherwise the pilots will start to feel unrealistic side forces due to gravity. To solve this problem, engineers use an algorithm called a washout filter, which links the dynamics of the aircraft to the roll angle of the simulator platform. To see this filter in action, on the left hand side of the screen, you can see the pilot's view of the aircraft. And on the right hand side, you can see the effect of the washout filter and how it's controlling the tilt of the platform based on the movement of the aircraft. Notice how the roll rate starts and then stops again. Every time the roll rate changes, the platform quickly tilts in the direction of that change. And if I add the graphs down below, you can see very clearly how changes in roll rate on the left are activating the roll angle of the platform on the right. These dynamics are exactly what's going to trigger your vestibular system. But the really clever part of the washout filter lies in the fact that as soon as the roll rates calm down, then the platform will always tend to move back to neutral or zero roll. This is called washing out the signal, and it makes sure that we never tilt the platform for too long. And as you might have guessed, it's also exactly what we need to stop the side forces that we've been struggling with. By also applying washout filters to the pitch and yaw axes, we've now got a solution for the aircraft's rotational movement. But rotations aren't the only type of movement that the platform is capable of dealing with. Something we haven't yet talked about are the forces that the pilot feels due to acceleration and gravity. And for this, we need to talk about a concept called specific force. An easy example is to consider what the pilot would feel when the aircraft is in a climb with a high pitch angle at a constant speed. Because of the pitch angle, a portion of gravity will be pulling backwards relative to the plane. In turn, the pilot will feel the forward reaction force of their seat as it supports their body. To get the pilot to feel this force in the simulator, we can simply pitch the platform up which will also cause a forward reaction force in the same way that the real plane does. This simple example seems to suggest that humans can sense components of gravity, or at least under certain circumstances. And although this approach is definitely heading in the right direction, we haven't yet covered the full picture. Let's take a look at what happens if we're flying straight and level, but this time with increasing speed, which is to say a certain amount of acceleration. First of all, notice how throughout the maneuver, gravity will be pointing straight down, which means that it won't contribute to any horizontal forces. During the acceleration, you'll feel as if you're being pushed into your chair, which is especially noticeable during takeoff. But note that what you're actually feeling is the chair pushing you forward as it accelerates the mass of your body, which is trying to resist this movement due to inertia. So to get the pilot to experience this force, we would have to tilt the simulator in exactly the same way as we did in the gravity situation. But keep in mind that even though the platform is pitching up, 
The visual information on the inside dome gives pilots the feeling that they're flying straight and level, since this is the only visual information that they have. This creates the illusion that the aircraft is accelerating straight ahead, which to the pilots is not only believable, but almost impossible to resist, since all of their sensory organs are giving them a consistent illusion. So even if we choose to think about gravity and acceleration as two separate phenomena, it's crucial to realize that without the context provided by your eyes, gravity and acceleration are experienced as the same sensation. That also explains why we tilt the simulator in exactly the same way in both cases. A common misunderstanding about motion systems is that humans can feel either gravity or acceleration. In reality, this isn't entirely true, because even though your brain may interpret the force of your seat as acceleration or gravity, the only thing that pilots can truly feel is the force of the chair itself. This reaction force is what is meant by the term specific force. The formula to calculate specific force is actually pretty simple, and also opens up a whole new way of looking at the problem. As you'd expect, the equation suggests that people will feel a combination of acceleration and gravity. And in the event of spatial disorientation, it's exactly these two terms that our brain can accidentally mix up. But the left-hand side of this equation says that we can also calculate specific force by summing all the forces acting upon the aircraft except weight, and then dividing by the mass of the aircraft. To demonstrate how this works, let's take a look at what happens in a decelerating climb in which thrust equals drag. When we take the sum of all forces along the horizontal direction except weight, then drag will cancel out thrust. So even though there will be a net force pulling the aircraft backwards due to gravity, this equation is telling us that the people inside the plane won't be able to feel it. And if you think about it, this makes complete sense, since the gravity component that would be pushing you forward is being cancelled by the deceleration, which is pulling you backwards. This is similar to how you can skate up a half pipe, but stay completely balanced on the skateboard without gravity pulling you off of it. Finally, if you're an engineer who's trying to calculate the forces that the pilots are feeling, it's way easier to simply sum the aerodynamic and thrust forces than to calculate accelerations and gravity components. Even though both methods will of course lead to the same result. To make the simulator even more realistic, there's one final trick that we can implement. During the first few moments of a particularly quick force, let's say if the pilot slams the throttles, the entire platform will move forward as it pitches up, and there is a very good reason for this. When the platform pitches to induce specific force, there is a limit to how fast we can rotate the simulator since if we pitch too quickly, this would result in false rotational cues coming from the pilot's inner ear. As the aircraft initially accelerates, we can use the surge axis of the simulator to give the feeling of being pushed in your seat. Then, as the platform starts to rotate, we can ease and wash out the surge to let gravity take over and produce the long-term specific force that we need. We can also apply the same two filters in the other direction as well. High frequency movements are washed out by translating the platform, whereas slower, low frequency forces are taken care of by rolling the simulator. At this point, you might be thinking, well, if gravity and acceleration are experienced in exactly the same way, and are therefore in some sense the same, how can our brains know, literally, which way is up? I mean, it's not as if people are constantly falling over in daily life because their sense of balance is all confused. 
This is because a large part of our sense of orientation in the world comes from our eyes and our visual field. This is also the reason that we can do such an amazing job at tricking people in our flight simulators. Because the fact that the movement of the platform does not necessarily need to correspond with the orientation of the aircraft is the key to understanding and designing motion systems. This also brings us full circle to what caused the F-18 to crash. Because it was dark and cloudy, the pilot didn't have the same amount of visual cues which would otherwise allow him to disentangle gravity from acceleration. As a result, the acceleration of the launch got misinterpreted as gravity, meaning that he felt as if he was in a steep climb. In an effort to reduce the climb that he thought was happening, he pushed the stick forward and the aircraft descended into the ocean. If you're interested in studying at TU Delft or working with this world-leading institution, you should really consider joining us by checking the description. On that note, huge thanks to Olaf Strossmer, René van Parse, and Max Mulder from the Control and Simulation section at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.